Um, welcome everyone to our OpenSIM webinar. Uh, my name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Associate Director of our National Center for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research, and I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Tunch Akbas, who's joining us from uh, Harvard University. And he will be presenting on characterizing hyperreflexia and abnormal coordination in post-stroke stiff knee gait. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of intro. So next slide, please. Uh, so OpenSim is freely available software to visualize the musculoskeletal system and simulate movements of humans and animals. Uh, and so the goal of our webinar series is to showcase the cutting edge research that's being performed with the OpenSim software. In addition, since OpenSim is a large and geographically diverse community of users, uh, an additional goal of the webinar series is to provide a platform so that members of the OpenSim community, like all of you, uh, can communicate and form new collaborations. Uh, next slide. A couple quick reminders about the webinar format. Uh, we definitely want to leave time for questions and hear all of your questions, but we'll do that at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll use the Q&A panel in your WebEx controls. Um, if you need any additional technical help, you can consult the guide on our website uh, or send a chat message to one of the hosts. Next slide. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today's webinar. So Tunch Akbas is a postdoctoral fellow in the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in the Wyss Institute. His research focuses on the development of assistive devices for gait recovery following injuries such as stroke and spinal cord injury. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechatronics engineering from Sabanchi University and his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Akbas has authored several peer-reviewed articles, including in the journal Biomechanics and Frontiers in Neurology, uh, and he's also a past participant in our OpenSIM workshops. Uh, so we're excited to hear more about your research today, and with that, I will let you take it away. Don't forget to unmute your audio. Um, you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Tunch. All right, perfect, perfect. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I will be presenting a portion of my PhD work from University of Texas Austin uh, in this webinar, which characterized abnormal neuromuscular mechanisms observed in post-stroke gait, particularly quadriceps hyperreflexia and how it relates to involuntary abnormal coordination patterns during stiff knee or stiff leg gait following stroke. So stiff knee gait is the most common gait disability following stroke, and it is defined as the insufficient knee flexion during swing phase, which prevents the person to clear their foot off the ground. As a result, people with stiff knee gait often develop compensations such as hip circumduction or hip hiking, which is demonstrated in the figure here, to increase their foot clearance. These compensations result in long-term joint pain, increased risk of falls, and makes the walking energy inefficient. So the video here shows a person with post-stroke stiff knee gait, and one can observe the reduced knee flexion and the resulting hip circumduction and hip hiking on the impaired side, which is the left side for this case. Previous studies attempted to find physiological, kinematic, and kinetic correlates for stiffening gait, including prolonged quadriceps activity, increased muscle strength in hamstrings, as well as increased knee extension movement during swing phase, and reduced knee flexion velocity during swing phase. Aside from these, individual correlates, uh, muscle core contractions and co-activations between knee extensors and ankle plantar flexors prior to swing and reduced amount of coordinated muscle activities were related to the reduced knee flexion in post-stroke gait as well. From an engineering point of view, the reduced knee flexion velocity can be improved using a robotic assistive device which is capable of providing knee flexion torque prior to the swing phase. And this idea was applied in previous study where the knee flexion velocity was increased during swing by providing knee flexion torque 
with an externally actuated knee brace. And the assumption here was uh, that uh, this assistance will provide enough toe clearance with the increased knee flexion, and it will result in reduction in the compensatory patterns mentioned in the previous slide, such as circumduction or hip hiking. And the video indicates the increased knee flexion of a, a stiff knee gait participant with the device. And it can be seen that the device was uh, able to provide enough knee flexion for toe clearance. However, instead of decreasing the compensations, it increased hip abduction, which is the primary component of circumduction. So the assumed robotic assistance act as a perturbation instead. Here, the green line indicates the perturbation versus the gray line showing the baseline for a participant with stiff knee gait. And you can see the simultaneous increase in the hip abduction together with the increased knee flexion with the perturbation. This abnormal knee flexion and hip abduction coupling was not observed in healthy individuals, and the subjects did not have issues with balance during the experiment, and the device was only providing the assistance in the knee flexion direction. So the, we couldn't find any biomechanical explanation for the observed behavior. And we hypothesized it should be originated by an abnormal neuromuscular mechanism specific to stiff knee gait. And taking a step back and going into these different abnormal neuromuscular mechanisms uh, or impairments after stroke, uh, we can categorize them in three different categories. Uh, and the first would be the muscle weakness, which could be observed in two ways. First would be due to the decreased activation input from neural pathways at the initial stage of the stroke, where the patient described it as feeling very heavy on their affected limb. And it can also occur as muscle atrophy due to disuse of muscle over a long period of time, which is prominent in chronic stage. So here the video demonstrates the reduced grasping force through a physical therapy exercise, where the therapist instructs the patient to hold on the ball as tight as possible but yet he can easily remove it from his hand. Spasticity is another impairment defined as velocity dependent increase in muscle tone, and it can be observed as hypertonia with increased tightness or hyperreflexia, which is defined as elevated reflex responses following a stimulation. This can be clearly observed in an elevated tendon jerk reflex response is stimulated by tapping the tendon with a reflex hammer, as seen in the video, from a patient with a quadriceps hyperreflexia. During my presentation, I will refer to spasticity from the aspect of hyperreflexia. And the third impairment is the abnormal coordination, which is defined as the lack of independent joint control. And it can occur involuntarily, so when you apply a perturbation or a stimuli on a specific joint, such as knee extension, there will be an abnormal involuntary reaction in another joint, such as ankle plantar flexion, which is demonstrated in post-stroke participants before. And it can also occur voluntarily. For instance, in this video, the patient was instructed to flex his shoulder, but he's also abducting his shoulder. So in this case, shoulder flexion and abduction is voluntarily coupled with each other for the patient. Going back to the observed knee flexion hip abduction coupling in stiff knee gait, uh, the device was able to provide enough knee flexion which resulted in increased toe clearance which was addressing one of these issues which is the hamstring muscle weakness and the reduced knee flexion velocity in stiff knee gait. However, the resulting unexpected increase in hip abduction indicates it made the other impairments and their interactions with each other worse. So to restore health walking, we need to understand the causal relationships between these impairments and stiff knee gait and their interactions between one another. And this was the main motivation for the study I will be presenting in this webinar. Moving on, I will first go through the characterization of abnormal coordination patterns using OpenSIM, where I will describe the simulation framework we have used to test our hypothesis for the observed abnormal flexion abduction coupling. And also, I will talk about the additional steps we took to modify the model and check the dynamic consistency of the simulations. Similar abnormal cross-limb coordination patterns 
uh, to the observed one which we have, which is knee flexion and hip abduction, was previously studied and quantified. Uh, for instance, Finney et al. revealed an abnormal cross-planar reflexive coupling between rectus femoris, which is one of the quadriceps muscles, and hip AD ductors, which is a ductor longus, uh, which is the one of the AD ductor muscles. And it is demonstrated in the figure on the right side. And this coupling was revealed by applying a robotic perturbation in AB ductor direction and observing the knee extensor muscle activity and doing the vice versa using a robotic perturbation as seen in the uh, figure on the left. And since abnormal coordination patterns are context dependent, and this study was uh, done during a sitting posture, we hypothesized that there could be a cross-planar abnormal reflexive response in rectus femoris and AB ductors instead of AD ductors uh, in stiffening gait uh, due to the observed excessive hip abduction uh, following the robotic knee flexion perturbation. And this will be coupled with an abductor activity. To test this hypothesis, we required two different variables. The first one was an accurate measure to detect the initiation of the stretch reflex response coming from the quadriceps, particularly the rectus femoris. And we also wanted to obtain an estimation for abductor muscle activations which were not accessible with surface EMG measures. So we decided to use OpenSIM to estimate these measures. And the figure shows the simulation framework. We implement the generic gate simulation framework of OpenSIM with a couple of adjustments. First, we condense the head, arms, and trunk bodies into a pelvis body segment in the model since there were no markers on the bodies during the experiment. Then we scaled the weight and body segments of the GATE 2392 model for each subject and calculate the joint angles by using the inverse kinematics tool. Then we applied the residual reduction algorithm or RRA and made adjustments to verify the dynamic consistency of the simulation. RRA is a GATE specific tool which runs forward dynamics by equalizing the equation of motions from body segments and experimentally measured external forces. And since there are artifacts, misalignments, and unaccounted external forces during the experiments, the equality between these equations were maintained by artificially introduced residual forces and moments, as seen in the equation on the right. In our experiments, we use the generic external force measures such as ground reaction forces coming from the treadmill, but we have also included the knee flexion perturbations coming from the device and estimated handrail forces, which I will discuss in detail later. And after RRA, we use the computed muscle control or CMC tool. And CMC uh, determines the simulated muscle states, including muscle forces, muscle activations, and muscle fiber properties, such as fiber stretch velocity or fiber length. By distributing the joint moments calculated previously to the modeled muscle actuators. To estimate the reflex initiation of the quadriceps, we use simulated fiber stretch velocities which I will refer to as VEL, so it will be a muscle name and the VEL will uh, indicate the fiber stretch velocity. And we also used simulated muscle activations, particularly for abductor muscle groups, which I will refer to as SIM, so it will be the muscle name with the SIM. Uh, to start with the modified equations for the residual reduction algorithm, um, the device applies a torque couple on tie and shank during the experiments. And we added this torque couple to simulation as external force couple femur and tibia, which act as tie and shank bodies for the OpenSIM model. And these external force couples were applied in opposite directions from the center of mass of the corresponding bodies, as demonstrated in the uh, figure on the right. And these couples can be summarized by the equation here and condensed as follows. Going back to RRA equation, we included the experimental ground forces as an external force, as in the generic model, together with the force vectors of the knee flexion perturbation. And both of them are indicated on the right figure, which is from an animation uh, simulation. 
evaluated the model by comparing the simulated torques at the knee from residual reduction algorithm with and without the simulated assistance, which was indicated in the figure uh, with the solid and dashed lines respectively. And then we compared the differences between simulation results with and without the simulated assistance against the experimental measures to verify the dynamic consistency of the simulation. And the maximum average root mean square error was below 0.01 newton meter, indicating the simulated torque in RRA was consistent with the experimental measures. Another challenge was to account for unmeasured unilateral handrail use of uh, stroke participants, which would reduce the accuracy of the model. And in recent studies, it has been shown that the handrail forces in vertical direction can be successfully estimated using the residuals obtained from RRA. And we expand this assumption for all the residual force and moment components, but we calculated the differences between the equations of motions from body segments and the experimentally measured external forces and moments prior to running RRA. And we applied the resulting force and moment differences on pelvis body segment as an estimate of forces and moments induced by handrail force. So here the first equation on the left indicates the equation of motions obtained from each body segments and other external forces, the difference between those two. And the second equation on the right uh, shows the torque differences between the rate of change in angular momentum for each body segment and the resulting moments of the external forces acting on pelvis body segment. So the generic model and the modified equations of motions during RRA were shown uh, on the equations below, and the top one shows the generic equations, and the bottom equation shows the modified version. And the resulting residuals between the simulations indicate the modified equations with additional external forces and moments result in over residual forces, especially in vertical direction, a vertical force direction, which makes sense assuming a larger proportion of the handrail support would be in the vertical direction for uh, participants with stroke. Rectus femoris as a muscle has a small moment arm around abduction direction. So another question was the possibility of RF overactivity resulting in the observed excessive abduction by itself. And to evaluate this possibility, we used forward simulations with prescribed joint angles which are derived from the inverse kinematic solutions. Except three unprescribed joint angles were driven by the simulated muscle states calculated by the CMC tool uh, to test the resulting effect of RF overactivity. The uns unprescribed motions were uh, assigned to sagittal knee and hip angles and frontal hip angles as demonstrated in the figure for the impaired side. And then we simulated the muscle states for three different scenarios and insert them to our forward simulation. The first one is using the baseline muscle activations from the CMC as demonstrated here. So each muscle uh, activations is described with M and then there are total of N muscle actuators in the simulation. And the uh, number X corresponds to RF just for demonstration, X femoris. And uh, the second, for the second scenario, we implemented the full RF activation. So we just replaced the RF activation profile uh, from the baseline activations. And finally, for the third scenario, we applied the activation profiles obtained with the knee flexion perturbation coming from the device. And all these scenarios are run on a representative step for a participant with stiff knee gait. The figure here represents the resulting peak hip abduction uh, trajectories from these three scenarios. And it indicates the peak hip abduction angle, even with the full RF activation, did not exceed the peak hip abduction angle coming from the perturbation, which suggests that rectus femoris overactivity is highly unlikely to generate the increased hip abduction by itself. Different portion of the experimental protocol 
of, this, of the previous study while used in the simulation. So I will give a brief description of the protocol here. It starts with an initial calibration period to estimate the torque which results in desired peak knee flexion angle for the subject and followed by a baseline condition where the participants fear the device but no assistance were applied and continued with assistance uh, period where subjects were provided appropriate knee flexion assistance which is determined from the initial calibration period. And we simulated 15 steps from baseline and 30 steps from the assistance period for each participant. And the selected regions for the simulated steps were indicated in the green segments on the protocol figure above. And we peak simulated RF fiber stretch velocities and uh, the following uh, RF activations as an indicator of the reflex initiation. So going back to our hypothesis, we predict the correlation between the increased RF fiber stretch velocity, uh, which is indicated by RF well, and following rectus femoris activation, which is uh, activated, uh, which is uh, indicated by RF sim, will indicate excessive stretch reflex response or hyperreflexia coming from rectus femoris. And correlation of the simultaneous abductor activation around the peak uh, rectus femoris activation will indicate the abdominal coupling between extensors and abductors. Here, the simulation of a representative step with and without perturbation from a participant with stiff knee gait is demonstrated. And rectus femoris and gluteus medius muscle are used for demonstration for the quadriceps and abductor muscle groups respectively, although the model includes all the major muscle groups, including all the abductor muscles and all the quadriceps. And red color on the animation indicates the activation of the muscle. And here, for the perturbation case, the green vectors indicate the simulated knee flexion perturbation torque. The scene uh, from the, the uh, muscle there was an increase in RF activation together with the gluteus medius activation indicated by the red color, especially exaggerated with the perturbation. Let me look at the frontal plane. Uh, it also indicates the excessive hip abduction, which is exaggerated even further with the uh, introduced torque perturbation. For all simulated steps, the stimulation onset is uh, assigned by the peak RF fiber stretch velocity indicated by the red circle in this figure. Following the perturbation onset coming from the device, which is indicated by the vertical red lines, uh, dashed vertical red lines. And then we take the peak RF activations within the involuntary time period following the peak RF fiber stretch velocities, which is indicated by the green circle. And we predict the correlation between uh, these two measures will indicate the RF hyperreflexia observed in participants with post-stroke stiff knee gait. And then we integrated the simultaneous uh, simulated abductor activations around the peak RF activations. And we predict the correlation between peak RF activation and corresponding abductor activation will indicate the involuntary coupling between the extensors and abductors. The figure shows a representative step of a healthy control during baseline, where the normalized row RF EMG values were also indicated by gray bars in addition to the simulated measures demonstrated earlier. And it can be observed that the peak RF activation uh, was uh, quite small following the peak RF fiber stretch velocity. The representative baseline step from a stroke participant was also indicating the low RF activation, uh, although the timing is shifted more close to the toe, which could be due to the um, an impairment such as uh, increased RF activity in preceding phase. And when we look at the simulated strides from steps with the knee flexion perturbation, 
uh, there was a considerable increase in representative step for stroke participants, both in peak area fiber stage velocity, which is indicated by the red circles, and there's a small increase, and uh, the RF activations following that RF fiber stage velocity measure. And the corresponding gluteus medius activity, uh, which is shown by the solid black lines, was also increased, indicating the involuntary coupling between rectus femoris and gluteus medius. And this was also observed uh, from the EMG measures collected from rectus femoris. For healthy controls, there were no major changes in uh, the knee flexion perturbation. Uh, except an increase in peak RF fiber stage velocity. Extending these findings to group level, the figure indicates each simulated step for all the participants, where y-axis is the peak RF activation following the peak RF fiber stage velocity, and x-axis indicates the peak RF fiber stage velocity measures. And the subplots indicate the rest of the steps from the representative participants shown earlier. And for the group level, the simulated RF activation increased with RF fiber stage velocity only in those uh, with post-stroke stiffening gait. And uh, there was a significant correlation between those two variables, suggesting an excessive reflex response from rectus femoris or <clears throat> RF hyperreflexia during stiffening gait. When we looked uh, at the simultaneous gluteus medius activation uh, with the uh, um, RF activation, around the RF activation, uh, the simulated steps from stiffening gait were significantly more correlated compared to the healthy controls indicating an abnormal involuntary coupling between rectus femoris and gluteus medius, which appears to be unique uh, for those with post-stroke stiffening gait. These results suggest an ab abnormal reflex coupling between uh, RF and gluteus medius muscles was initiated by hyperreflexia. So this result shows an initial evidence relating RF hyperreflexia to an abnormal coordination pattern during stiffening gait, and it was similar to the some of the abnormal neuromuscular mechanisms observed in previous studies during rest uh, and static contexts for post strokes. And based on these findings, uh, the next question is: Can we inform the future robotic interventions to improve walking quality uh, following stroke, or uh, can we restore healthy walking? And if so, how can we do it? An appropriate assistance strategy could be achieved by applying a hip flexion assistance or a combination of knee flexion and hip flexion assistance uh, to improve knee flexion angle for our case, uh, which could avoid uh, the initiation of RF hyperreflexia. Uh, but the question lies again to how can we find the appropriate assistance strategy? So what should be the torque on each of these joints and how should we apply it? One way could be restricting the assistance from initiating RF hyperreflexia by setting certain boundaries using the correlates of reflex initiation found in the previous simulation study is RF fiber stage velocity measures, like the peak RF fiber stage velocity measures. Um, increasing the maximum knee flexion angle uh, to restore uh, healthy walking. And the hypothesis implementing virtual assistance for hip flexion would help increase knee flexion while shortening the RF fiber length, which would reduce the peak RF fiber stage velocity measures. And in return, it will prevent hyperreflexia. And as a result, it will offset the deleter deleterious effects initiated by the RF hyperreflexia, which was observed in the previous study with the only knee flexion perturbation. Going back to the protocol, we used the calibration period, which implemented incremental assistive torque to determine a torque threshold for RF hyperreflexia. Here on the figure, the top row indicates the applied knee flexion torque perturbations during calibration period, which starts from 10 Newton meter and increases up to 34 Newton meter uh, with 2 Newton meter increment for a representative participants with stiffening. 
and the corresponding rows indicates the knee flexion angles, knee extension velocities, and simulated RF fiber stage velocities and RF EMG measures in the rest of the rows. For each simulated step, we use the peak knee flexion angle as the desired outcome measure. And P extension velocity and RF fiber stage velocity were collected as indicators of reflex initiation, together with the RF EMG values integrated over temporal 100 millisecond period, period prior to tow. And this was used as an, ex, uh, as an additional experimental measure. And the, these measures for the incrementally increasing knee flexion perturbations are indicated on the figure right here with uh, the triangles. And the shaded areas indicate the mean plus minus standard deviation measures observed in healthy baseline for the same walking speed. So we can interpret these areas or these shaded areas as healthy or desired regions. And the reflexive threshold was determined when the corresponding correlates exceed these boundaries, especially the upper boundaries for the RF, peak RF fiber stretch velocity and peak knee extension velocity measures. So here, the corresponding torque threshold was indicated with the dashed black line for the given participant. We found a threshold for one of the participants, but the threshold is generalizable for the rest of the participants, or can we actually determine a, a similar threshold for all the other participants? And uh, so we applied the same simulation framework for the rest of the participants in our population and found that seven out of eight participants uh, indicated a torque threshold. And you can see here the subject specific torque thresholds and the corresponding knee extension velocities and RF fiber stretch velocities, which were above the upper boundaries, which was indicated uh, below the table here. We use low, medium and high torque measures found by trial and error to simulate virtual assistance for combinations is a next step. So again, the idea was to implement a hip flexion assistance or a combination of hip flexion and knee flexion assistance to avoid uh, these, uh, the, the peak RF fiber stage velocities to go above the upper boundaries. And we applied the stimulated muscle activation profiles obtained from the computed muscle control tool or CMC tool for baseline walking together with the virtual assistant torque combinations. And we prescribed the joint angle trajectories uh, from the inverse kinematic solutions for all the joint angles except the uh, sagittal knee and sagittal and frontal hip angles of the impaired side. And we determined the peak RF fiber stage velocity and peak knee flexion measures from each simulation and compared it with the healthy boundary measures. So for instance, high torque and uh, high torque in knee flexion and hip flexion result in excessive peak knee flexion angle and excessive peak RF fiber stage velocity outside the boundaries of healthy regions. And uh, running the simulation for all the rest of the uh, torques, we found two different assistive combinations which resulted in appropriate assistance where for peak, peak knee flexion angle and peak RF fiber stage velocities were within the boundaries. So the animation on the left indicate the baseline step, which without any perturbation or assistance. And the animation on the right here shows the assistive threshold measure for the same participant, which uh, exceeds the peak RF fiber stage velocity and peak knee extension velocity boundaries while not achieving the desired peak knee flexion angle. And finally, the animation on the right indicates the appropriate, the appropriate assistance combination.
resistance for knee flexion and hip flexion, which show, uses the high hip flexion torque and low knee flexion torque. And it results in the desired or appropriate knee flexion angle, and also the RF fiber stage velocities were below the uh, upper boundary limits. So we found the subject-specific reflexive threshold for the previously applied knee perturbations and implemented virtual assistance using OpenSIM. And the simulation suggests specific yet non-intuitive combinations of knee and hip torques, which could be result in appropriate assistance. So for both of these studies, the experimental validation is required. Uh, for the simulation study, we still need to uh, find whether this coupling was there using uh, uh, experimental measures such as um, like stimulation results, EMG measures from stimulation of the muscles or other indicators of reflexes during gait. And we also need to verify the efficacy of the introduced virtual assistance um, experimentally. And this iterative framework can be generalized to find an optimal assistance to restore healthy gait uh, following, and it can be adapted for different impairments after stroke, or uh, it can also use for other neuromuscular injuries. And uh, the iterative framework will start with an experimental intervention uh, to reveal the specific abnormal neuromuscular mechanisms, and then continue with characterization of these mechanisms using either a simulated measures or experimental measures. And finally, this will inform the next generation of device design and development to achieve the appropriate assistance. And by following these iterations, uh, we could determine the user-specific optimal assistance strategies to restore healthy gait. And with that, uh, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. James Salser, and my co-advisor, Dr. Richard Neptune, and my colleagues from University of Texas at Austin, and all of our collaborators throughout this, which helped us throughout this presented work. And also, I would like to thank OpenSIM team and NCSRR for the kind invitation and letting me present in this webinar. And then we can continue with the questions, I guess. Thanks, Tanj, for the great talk. That's really interesting work um, and a really cool combination of simulation and experiments and um, looking at assistive device strategies. Um, we'll now go ahead and open up to questions. Uh, so if you have a question, find the WebEx Q&A panel, type in your question. Um, make sure you're not sending it privately or sending it just to the host. Make sure it goes out, um, at least to all panelists. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, well, people are typing those in. I'll go ahead and ask one question. Um, in the first part of the talk, you mentioned how you set up the simulations and um, how you handled the hand, computing the hand real forces. And um, a fairly minor question, but was wondering whether you looked at what those um, estimated hand real forces were and whether they seem reasonable in terms of, for example, how big they were compared to the ground reaction force or body weight? Um, yes, yeah, so for, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an instrumented handrail during the actual experiment, so that was the whole idea for estimating those, those measures, because uh, we don't have those. But mainly we used uh, uh, the residuals result in the simulations to verify that the measures we have obtained from the differences of the equation of motions and the external forces were correct. Uh, but I, uh, I think uh, to, it should be still verified, uh, perhaps with a, like a six degree of freedom instrumented handrail, mm -hmm. um, and it would be nice uh, to have as a, as a feature work. Yeah, so, oh, for sure. we, I was we, wondering if you'd done any sort of back of the envelope comparisons to see whether the size of those handrail forces was reasonable and how much it compared to the groaning action force. So just how much were they supporting themselves with the handrail? And does that, you know, match up to what you would think? Yeah, yes. Uh, so for, for these, these participants in the study, they were not um, severely impaired. So they didn't rely on handrails too much. So the maximum forces we observed in the vertical direction, 
because that's what you will observe and if they li rely on the one of the handrails on their uh, affected side especially mm -hmm. uh, and um, those forces did not exceed um, uh, around like they will usually lower than 50 newtons although they were different for each participant okay that's great thank you um, now we'll go ahead and take some questions from the audience. So first we have a question for John Chow. He says, thanks for the presentation. Um, did you stroke subjects have clinical evidence of hypertonia in the affected rectus femoris? Uh, and how did you differentiate hypertonia from muscle stiffness? Um, so we had like uh, clinical measures. Unfortunately, I didn't prepare the table, but the extended measures for the hypertonia and the clinical assessments were included in the publication. Uh, and okay, uh, so not, 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 um, oh, sorry. A little background noise. So, uh, yeah, so that we had like clinical measures for these participants and uh, the assessment results are demonstrated in the table. Unfortunately, I don't have those results here in the slides, but uh, it can be checked in the publication. But some some of those patients had the uh, uh, hypertonia, but it was not general for the whole group. So the elimination criteria was based on the reduced knee flexion angle during walking. Okay, thanks. Um, so now a question from Mohammed Reza Rezai. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so interested to know more about how you model the knee brace and open sim so the forces or constraints that you used uh, sure so we had the experimental torque measures coming from uh, torsion springs and we basically used them and divided to each individual bodies which were the tie and the shank and applied these force couples in the simulation and this can be done for any uh, bodies in the open sim, so you can generate external forces just similar to ground reaction forces. Uh, but the, the advantage of the device we used was it was only providing a single motion, which is the knee flexion. So there was no like uh, extended uh, um, like dynamic complexity where like you will see if you are applying like multiple degrees of freedom or multi like if you are assisting multiple joints. So that made made the implementation of the devices assistance relatively simple for our case okay thanks um so if you have other questions please go ahead and type those in oh here we go um now here's a question from ben uh bender markey uh thanks tunch he says i was wondering if you looked at or analyzed any changes in the posterior thigh hamstring muscle activations during the knee torque assistance because uh, yeah. it's likely that these muscles are getting pressure from the device and contributing to abduction. Um, so the brace itself, uh, I, can, can I get the question again? Sorry. So did you look at or analyze changes in the posterior thigh, the hamstring muscle activations mm -hmm. during the knee torque assistance? So we actually had an uh, alternative hypothesis uh, for, the, for a potential voluntary coupling between the hamstrings and uh, the abductor muscles. Um, so in that sense, there were like catch trials which were applied during assistance period uh, of the experiment and actually I have a slide maybe to show that if I can find it here uh, so the idea was again using a previous study which shows an abduction and the torque flexion coupling in these two different postures in post stroke and we use the catch trials here indicated by these small green areas where the, the perturbation was removed for a single step and compare it with the baseline to see whether there was an adaptation in the hamstring activity and whether it was correlated with the hip abductors. Uh, but uh, based on our analysis, we didn't find any, so, uh, so we used these two measures for it and we didn't find any correlation between the hamstring activity coming simultaneously with the abductor activity 
uh, for uh, group or between the conditions. So we, we checked like that as an alternative uh, hypothesis, I guess, but we didn't see any any significant difference between the groups. I hope it helped. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if there's follow-up, then feel free to type another question. Uh, now a question from Adam Charles. This is great talk. Um, did you look at the washout effects of the knee perturbations? And also, did you ever look at resistive perturbation rather than assistive torque generation? Um, so the experimental study was done uh, previously, actually by my um, advisor. So we didn't continue with doing more uh, experiments. So we didn't check the resistive effects in detail. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, for the washout effect, uh, uh, we actually did not see uh, a prominent washout effect in the participants, especially like they adapt to this uh, flexion perturbation in the first initial three steps and the washout was similar as well. So there were no adaptation and de-adaptation uh, that we observed during this experiment. I mean, that, that might be for, for a longer duration, there might be some adaptation, but for this study, it wasn't there. Okay, thanks. Um... Okay, if there are no other questions that come in from the audience, I'll go ahead and ask one more question. So I think something really important for those of us who are designing simulations and using them to assign design assistive devices is to think about how well they will translate to real humans and to experiments. And so you said that the next step is to try it out with an experiment. What do you think will be some of the, you know, key might be some of the key challenges in doing that um so i i guess it's always um, difficult to find experimental measures which you can verify the simulated results so the, the amount of simulated variables will always uh be larger than the experimental uh variables but Mm -hmm. One thing we can restrict is we can use the, the new or like more emergent, emerging technologies such as um, uh, ultrasound to, to kind of at least uh, check whether the, the fiber stretch velocities estimated from the simulations make sense and mm -hmm. uh, whether we can use them with these new devices. And mm -hmm. uh, for this simulation, the hip flexion was the next best thing to provide the knee flexion instead of just providing directly on the knee. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, as you increase the degree of freedom or the combined assistance, then you had uh, more complexity coming from the core contractions or um, just the complexity of the, the torques going simultaneously on two different joints. Mm -hmm. So to, to test them, I think um, the, the next set of experiments to be designed uh, where there's a clear experimental measures which could be correlated with the simulated measures. Gotcha. Especially if you want to extend it to the rest of the measures at least we need to make sense from like the um, layover between the, those, the, the, the measures and then uh, expand it to the rest of the simulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I definitely agree that using these new technologies to help improve and validate simulations will be really exciting over the next um, couple years here. Um, so I think with that, we will go ahead and wrap up the webinar. There's a couple more closing slides that I'll have you click through. Sure. Um, so, um, so thank you again, Tunch, for a great talk and to everyone in the audience for all the great questions. Um, I want to acknowledge the supporters of the OpenSim project in the uh, webinar series, so we're supported by several grants from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Uh, next slide. So you can get more information about our center and OpenSim uh, on our website, as well as other resources. Um, we also ask that you complete the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, this will help us improve the webinar series and help find new exciting topics for future webinars. Uh, I want to thank you again uh, for participating and hope you'll all continue to stay involved with the OpenSim project. 
Uh, thank you again, Tunch, and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you.